In today's video, I'll be looking at 10 common misconceptions I at some point believed about miniature painting and building. Chances are you have been misled about at least some of them too. Hey guys, I'm Zoltan and you're watching Phalanx Miniatures. If you are anything like me, you probably have also spent a ton of time watching miniature painting and building tutorials. When I started out painting, these were crazy useful to me. There are so many aspects of this hobby from building to cleaning and painting and an incredible amount of things to learn. The barrier of entry is crazy high. And while I learned a lot from all the content I consumed, and most of the things were helpful and true, over the years I also discovered that there is a lot of common knowledge that gets repeated a lot, especially for newcomers, that is actually not true, or at least not entirely. And some of those things can make the entry into the hobby seem even more daunting than it actually is, and can make it more tedious for those who are already in. There are probably way more than 10 of these misconceptions, but that's the number I'm going to tackle in this video. I'll start with the ones related to assembly and cleaning, and then we can move on to the painting part in the second half. Let's talk about sub-assemblies first. One of the most frequent advice I see given to especially newbie painters is to build their models in sub-assemblies, meaning that you should not attach parts of the model fully, but keep them separate and then glue them together only once they are painted. So, for example, you could keep the head, the power pack of a space marine or a gun separate and only attach them with the help of blue tech or not at all. The reason for this is that supposedly you will be able to reach all the parts of the model easier with the brush, like for example a torso that might be partially obscured by a gun held in front of it. That is supposed to make the painting easier and also produce better results, in theory at least. In reality though, this just makes the painting and priming process way more complex and tedious. Also, having the model in pieces is just a huge barrier for me to actually start painting it and I don't think I'm alone with this. And while you can get to the parts of the model that are hard to reach easier, but in practice, those won't be visible anyway, so it doesn't matter if you painted them or not. With black primer, they can simply be in shadow. Instead of suggesting sub-assemblies, the advice given to newbies should be, if you can't reach it with your brush, you won't be able to see it either, so don't stress about it. And unless you paint for a competition, this approach will allow you to paint more and better minis. At the same time, I need to mention that sub-assemblies can be very useful and sometimes necessary. If you really want to go for a 10 out of 10 paint job on the face of your mini and it is in this hard to reach spot, you might want to paint it separately and if you paint something big like a titan or a knight, you should really consider painting at least the armor panel separately. With the second one, let's move on to something basic but quite widespread, having to wash all your models before you start priming and painting them. A lot of the guides emphasize that before you start priming, it is crucial to wash your minis to remove the leftover release agent that is used to make it easier to get the sprue out of the mold in the factory. Now that is all well and good, but most guides have been around for a long time and some are from the era where most minis were either metal or resin. The current plastic models from Games Workshop and equivalent companies don't need any washing. I have been building and priming my models out of the box for years and I have had zero issues with the primer sticking to the plastic or rubbing off after. So if you are still giving your plastic models a nice bubble bath before assembly and priming, then you are most likely just wasting your time. But if you are painting metal or resin models, you should keep using that warm water and soap combo, otherwise you might have some paint adherence issues. In most guides you hear a lot about how you need to clean your model of mold lines and fill in any gaps before you start priming them. And obviously this is very important, but I also think this is blown out of proportion to the extent that it can be scary to newcomers. Based on most of the tutorials out there, it seems like you should be spending hours upon hours filing, sanding and polishing your minis to perfection, meticulously filling in every little gap with milliput or green stuff. But in reality, in 9 out of 10 cases I only use a hobby knife and nothing else. The sharp side to cut away anything that doesn't belong on the mini and the back of the knife for the whole cleanup process. With a little bit of practice with the knife you won't need any files, sandpaper or sanding sticks and you can even use a little trick to fill in the smaller gaps by scraping away the top layer over them and letting the excess settle in the gap. Now to give you the flip side, this is mostly true for plastic minis. For metal and resin models you still need to do a little bit more to make them look presentable. Also this is obviously true when you are painting your troops or maybe something for your own display case but if you want to enter into a competition or maybe even golden demon then you have to put in a little bit more effort. But if you are at that level you probably already know how to do that. Pinning your models is another thing I thought of as an absolute must based on some of the videos I watched when I started out. Fortunately I realized rather quickly that you don't really need to pin any arms or legs, but for a very long time I still pinned all my models to their bases very fastidiously. It was one of those steps I always dreaded since I hated drilling into my meticulously painted models and I was just too lazy to take care of it before. After a while I realized that a bit of glue is more than enough in most cases. Either some plastic glue when you attach the model directly to the base or some super glue when you attach it to something that is not plastic. 
That being said, if you're building a huge resin model like a Knight or a Titan, you should use some pins, otherwise you're going to regret it. For example, my Eldar Phantom Titan has so much metal in it that even Wolverine might get jealous. Let's finish the building part with one that really baffles me, the gravel and sand approach for basing. Various guides advise you to put some PVA glue on the base and then spread some gravel or actual sand on it. I guess the idea behind this is that A, this used to be the norm before the basing materials we have today became widely available and B, because it is supposed to be cheap. But the problem is that it looks terrible and if you count all the time that it requires to make it look somewhat okay, it's not even cheaper than the alternatives. I have been using two large containers of Vallejo texture paste for years now and they are still one third full. Just don't use the super overpriced Citadel ones and go for something like Vallejo or AK Interactive instead which will be literally dirt cheap per model, it will look better and you will have a much easier time doing it. Let's move on to the actual painting and start with one of my absolute favorites which is that you cannot let paint get into the ferrule of the brush. The little metal cylinder that keeps the hairs attached to the handle. This one was really giving me nightmares. I bought some high quality brushes relatively early on and I was terrified that I would mess them up since they cost a significant amount of money for something that small. So I did my very best to never allow paint to get into the ferrule, but of course this was very difficult or sometimes even impossible. This meant that I was anxious while painting and paying attention to this instead of actually enjoying myself. Then I saw some of my favorite painters on streams not caring about this and simply cleaning the brush after the session and realized that I am worrying for nothing. It is perfectly fine if some paint reaches there as long as it also comes out. You just have to learn how to care for your brushes properly and they will last a long time. I even made a video about this so if you want to see how I keep my brushes in top form I'll chuck the link into the right corner or you can find it on the channel. There are always a lot of questions from both new and seasoned painters about thinning paints on Reddit and other platforms. And whenever someone has trouble with this, some helpful person will always jump in saying that the problem is that they use water, telling them they should use some kind of thinner or flow improver product instead. In my experience this is completely unnecessary and doesn't solve the problem at all. Instead it just makes things more complicated since now you have to buy some potentially expensive products and you can be anxious about running out of them. In reality all you need is water to thin your paints unless you are going for some very specific technique that really requires it. As long as you are only using everyday techniques like base coating, layering, glazing or anything similar, you simply need to learn how to thin your paints properly, mostly by controlling how much moisture you have in your brush and removing any excess on a paper towel. The next one is about metallic paints and how I'm some kind of heretic if I put them on a wet palette. I guess the reasoning here is that the metallic pigments will contaminate the palette or something similar, but that has never happened to me and I have been using them on various wet palettes for quite some time now. Now it is true that I don't usually touch the water in the wet palette around the sponge with my brush like I have seen some painters do, so I don't transfer the pigments into the water that way, but so far I have never seen the pigments seep into the water or the sponge through the paper. Should you clean your cup after using metallics and before switching to a non-metallic paint? Yes, if there is enough pigment floating around in there it might contaminate other parts of the model. But will metallics ruin your wet palette if you put them on there? Nope. This is a weird one and maybe it's unique to me but when I started out painting I saw a lot of videos from big YouTubers about wet blending and how it's supposed to be this pro blending technique that everybody should know. Maybe it was some kind of fad at the time, like Slapchop is today, but I saw it everywhere. So for a long time I felt like if I want to be a good painter, I need to master it. Since then I would like to believe that I have become a much better painter, but wet blending is at the very bottom of my list of useful painting techniques. It's simply too messy and unpredictable to be useful. In this it is similar to dry brushing, but dry brushing is actually useful. During the last couple of years I used wet blending only once that I can remember and even then only on a whim. Let's finish with my absolute pet peeve, airbrushing. The airbrush seems to exist in a permanent quantum state in the hive mind of the miniature painting community. Somehow it manages to be seen as so easy that it's cheating and so complicated that only the elitists use it at the same time. In reality an airbrush is one of the most useful tools for a mini painter, whether they are painting lots of minis to a battle ready standard or only a few minis but to a very high standard. It definitely has a high learning curve, but after this initial hurdle it's super easy to use for simple tasks and there is a huge skill ceiling for the more complex applications. And it is far from cheating, it is a tool that you need to master just like the brush and it is better than the brush for some things and much worse in some others. And that's it, these were my top 10 current misconceptions about miniature painting. I hope that you found at least a couple that you also shared with me and if there is more that I didn't actually list then please share them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and you know the drill, please give it a like and subscribe, see you in the next one. Thank you.